to introduce our wonderful panelists today, starting with Aida Alami. She is a Moroccan freelance journalist. She reports from North Africa, France, the Caribbean, and more recently, Senegal. She regularly comp- contributes to the New York Times. Her work has also been published in the New York Review of Books, the FT, Bloomberg, amongst other prestigious publications. She earned her bachelor's degree in media studies at, Co- at Hunter College in New York, and she also has a master's degree in journalism at Columbia University, which we attended together, and that's how we met. <laughs> She covers migration, human rights, religion, politics, and racism. She spends a lot of time in France, uh, where she is directing a documentary feature on anti-racism, activists, and police violence in the country. I believe she's joining us today from Morocco, however. Um, Iman Hilal is an Egyptian freelance photographer based in Germany, covering the Middle East, Africa, and America. She's dedicated to covering hard news and documentary projects with a human rights focus, especially related to women's rights and religious minorities. She worked for years in Egypt on a project about sexual harassment. She is an award winner. Um, She's won multiple awards actually, amongst them the Egypt Press Photo Awards. She was a human rights fellow at the Magnum Foundation. And she also participated in the Dupe Swart Masterclass in 2015. She has finished her diploma in photography from the Danish School of Media and Journalism in 2018, and she is currently a master's student at F.H. Bielfeld. I do not think I pronounced that correctly, but points for trying. Hiba Shibani is a Libyan journalist, television producer, photographer, and documentary filmmaker. She has held positions at a number of Libyan and international media outlets, including Reuters, Libya TV, al Asima TV, and Naba News TV. Um, And she's also worked as a correspondent for a number of Libyan channels in the EU. In 2014, the civil war forced, sorry, the civil war in Tripoli forced Shivani to flee Libya with her family in part due to her coverage of the conflict. She's a women's rights activist and has produced television shows focusing on political and civil rights education for Libyan women. And she currently resides in Malta where she works as a media producer that was a mouthful for all three, um, but you were all so successful <laughs> that it's unsurprising that you have such prolific biographies. I'd like to start with you, Aida. Um, we have obviously seen a lot of excellent work from you covering migration and human rights amongst other topics over the past few years. And there's some movies, moving stories that I would like to ask you about. But first, I'd really like to focus a little bit on the trial of Amar Radi and also the situation with Suleiman Raisuni. I know that um, there's a difficult situation or environment for a journalist in Morocco at this time. And I wonder if you could talk about their situation in the context of press freedoms in Morocco. Sure, Uh, so hi everybody. Um, Thanks Zahra for the kind introduction. Uh, so the, the Suleiman Raisuni and Omar Radi are two prominent Moroccan journalists who were both sentenced to prison terms for uh, similar charges. Suleiman Raisuni for sexual assault and uh, Omar Radi for rape and spying. And uh, I mean, international NGOs have uh, flagged uh, countless violations of their rights throughout these trials uh, by international standards, their trials were not fair, uh, didn't get a chance to defend themselves uh, the way they should have. Um, and virtually today, it's, it's just very scary to be a journalist in Morocco because you can just get hit by charges like that and then you don't have a chance to defend yourself. And that's the situation today. And can you tell me a little bit about how you personally have navigated that situation? I know. Um, it's it's challenging for all journalists across Morocco, whether you are in or outside of the country. So how has that been for you? So uh, I've had different moments in, in how I've, I've covered Morocco. I covered it pretty intensely during the Arab Spring. We had some protests here. I wrote a lot about Morocco for a couple of years. And then I kind of moved on and, and worked on other topics. It's easier to not be a local journalist. Um, I work for international publications. I don't write that many articles a year on Morocco. Um, and I also work on these topics like migration and things like that, that stay away from the hot topics here. Um, and I, 
I think because of the niche I write in and, and the stuff I do, it's not too controversial. Uh, so I've been doing better than my colleagues who, who kind of cover to the core the politics here and, and they do these kind of investigations and business stories that end up getting them in trouble. Yeah, I mean, that must be incredible, incredibly difficult for you. And I think that many um, journalists across the region can relate in the sense that some of the subject matters from their home countries can be too risky to cover for a personal, from a personal perspective in terms of the personal risks um, and also difficult to cover. And that's a topic that um, is very much explored in this book, Our Women of the Ground, um, in the sense that the emotional toll that covering your own um, homeland or your own country can, can take on you can be incredibly challenging. Is that something that you can comment on or do you feel that you've in a way managed to avert that? Although actually your essay is very personal, just to take us back to the mm -hmm. essay in the book, in the sense that um, some of the subject matters that you covered hit very close to home. So I was wondering if you could tell us a bit about that. It is harder to cover home for many reasons. One, I'll give you a simple example. For example, the, the online harassment. I'm kind of, you know, I've had outbursts from readers uh, in the past covering other countries. Uh, for instance, the headscarf in France. And, and you know, I've even once I did a story on the Dominican Republic where I had a lot of people yelling at me online. But uh, when, it's, when it's online harassment in Morocco, it's, it really is very different from everything else just because the online harassment can turn into something else. It can turn into actual threats and, and things actually happening, which is, has happened to other journalists here. Uh, Morocco also has a way of using personal life and families and, and things like that against journalists. Um, journalists can be videotaped in their own homes. Phones are tapped. I mean, we, we just live in the state where we feel watched all the time and it just, becomes like, it's not like you're a journalist during the day and then you're at home at night and then you have your own life. It's like, they're both so intertwined, which is not something I feel when I'm outside of Morocco, let's say. Just whenever now, I mean, with the pandemic, I'm not uh, traveling the way I used to, but just recently I was in Senegal and just to be able to just do my interviews and then unplug from the job at night was, was quite nice, which is not possible in Morocco. Um, actually, and this is a really good transition into some of the other work that you've done, and I'd love to um, ask you about the story that you covered for the New York Times on, um, it's a Saturday profile, the title is It's a Joy for Me to Bury Them, a Quest to Honor a Migrant um, Dead. It, it was such um, a powerful story and a very personal story as well for the protagonist of your piece, and also it was tied to Morocco, so I was wondering if you could tell us a little bit about that piece too. Sure. So uh, the piece is about a man who's from um, uh, Western Africa who lives in northern Morocco, and he created a system to identify and, and, and find the families of, of people who die at sea, who just simply die in Morocco, but don't know anyone and no one knows who their families are, because a lot of people leave their countries and then disappear, and a lot of families never get closure. And I decided to prof profile this amazing person because he just does it it's completely selfless it's not a job he's paid to do it's not something he's ever been prepared to do in his life like nothing prepared him for this gigantic task of, of giving closure to families which is such a big thing because uh, in life we, we aren't just unequal when we're alive we're also unequal when we're dead and I thought that story illustrated that very well because it just you know, showed like he's just trying to give respect to these bodies and, and honor their deaths and, and, and use the rites and rituals that go, you know, depending on the religion you're a part of and so on. Yeah, I mean, the, um, there's one quote in there that's incredibly powerful when he says, it's a joy for me to bury them. Um, for him, it's kind of giving closure to families. So I, I felt that that mm -hmm. was one of it to my mind, one of your most powerful stories. And I would urge um, listeners to go and read that because it displays the, um, the humanity that Ida brings to so many difficult stories. So thank you for sharing your thoughts on that, Ida. Um, I'd love to, to go to you, Hiba, because I know we were just discussing that 
um, for some journalists across the region, it's too risky to report from your homeland during times of difficulty, um, whether that's a, a societal upheaval or conflict um, or all out war. And I know that in your situation, this is a very personal subject. And your essay um, goes into great detail about the struggles that you had as a journalist navigating, navigating that a very fine line between your personal life and your professional life. And then ultimately having to leave um, Libya, which to my mind is just one of the most difficult um, decisions that anyone would really have to take um, uh, both personally and professionally when you are so invested in the story of your homeland. So can you tell us a little bit about that experience? Um, well, let just um, I would like to start by saying hi to everyone and um, thank you for inviting me to this talk. And yes, it is personal, it is hard and uh, I think ladies will share, pretty much we all share the same um, point of view when it comes to being a citizen of this country and trying to, to report on it. And you will always be treated, especially if you're a woman, you're always going to be treated differently from a foreign journalist coming to cover this country. Um, my story, from my side of the story, um, at least, I, I was never expected to <clears throat> to face the amount of difficulties because we know the society norms and we know the traditions and you are prepared to face these traditions. You are not to face them, but more like work around them. You find your way through the, the crooks and, and, and the small, you know, um, versions of how you can find your way around. Um, I, I managed to do that um, at a great, unfortunately, personal loss, which is leaving the country eventually. Um, I do not regret it. Um, I only regret that now the situation is much worse for other female journalists. Um, at least the ones I know, my friends and colleagues, most of them, they're either left and they continue working from outside the country or they are still inside, but they try to avoid um, the important topics, human rights, war, uh, human rights um, topics, uh, women rights, uh, illegal immigration, and um, the militia um, or the human rights violation that's been committed by the different militias on the ground. Yeah, and I mean, I think it also, uh, to, to an extent, I would call it self-censorship for people who are actually still in those countries because they're navigating this very fine line where they're wanting to do the reporting, but they all understand that there are certain boundaries to that reporting, right? Yeah. If you cross this red line, then this may happen to you. And I know that in your experience, you actually, in some ways, either got close to the red lines or you crossed the red lines and then you suffered repercussions. Could you tell us some of the details on that. And in, in particular, I'd like it if you could tell us what you feel now that you've had distance from that, right? So how do you feel about the work that you did now that you've been away for so long? Uh, like I said, I have no regrets, but maybe there were some stories um, uh, uh, that particularly could have endangered my family who are still in Libya, still in Tripoli, they, they still live there, my brothers live there, my, my family, my mom, my dad, and some of the stories that we covered um, were not, um, some some parties are not happy with them. I don't want to really mention names because these militias or the militia leaders, they're still there on the ground, uh, or uh, now they're actually, uh, they uh, legitimize themselves and they became political parties and they actually even have positions within the government, the new government. So things got even more and more interesting now. Um, but yeah, back in the days when they were just militias, um, they they just enjoyed picking on um, journalists in general, all journalists, but female journalists, especially if they were Libyan, they they felt like they have the right to the, to censor their voices even more. And um, there were uh, more than one occasion where my family got. Um, uh, well, they got in touch with my family. Some actually even got came to my house uh, one time. I was actually reporting from Tunisia and they couldn't get in touch with me, this particular militia. So they sent someone to my dad to deliver just a very simple message. You either tell your daughter to shut up and stop writing or the consequences will not be something she would like to face. 
to put it yeah, lightly because I cannot really <laughs> translate the exact language to you. But I remember my father, I, I don't even think my mom knew about this because he was like, he's calling me and he was like, what? Shaking up. He's like, listen, I know this is your job and I support you. But there's other elements that you, you need to start thinking about, which is, you know, me, your mom, your, your brothers, your family, um, that could eventually be jeopardized because of these reports. And he's like, I'm not going to tell you not to report on them, which I truly appreciate my dad saying, saying that. He's like, just try to be careful. Yeah, it's so, yeah. It's so fascinating um, because obviously you did such incredible work despite those circumstances. And I'd like for us to move into the subject or the, the theme that very much emerges in, in our women on the ground on the access that, that women have. So there are all those struggles that they're facing, but at the same time, they have access to particular stories in the sense that um, perhaps the people who are being interviewed or the sources of those stories wouldn't feel as comfortable with a foreign journalist or with a male journalist, um, a non-Libyan journalist, let's say. And I know that you had a story that you felt particularly um, close to, which is on the subject of um, Libyan women at the time not being able to give the nationality um, to their to their daughter, um, but you don't have to talk about that story. But I wonder if you could talk a little bit about that sort of special access. Did you feel that you had that at the time? I did. Uh, there there were times when I covered stuff like Sif Islam's uh, um, trial, for example, and me and other female Libyan female journalists were banned from the courtroom saying you're not allowed to. And yeah, the CNN reporter who also happened to be female, she was allowed in because she was a foreigner, which we found hilarious. But there were other stories like the one you mentioned, just to give a, a quick background. Um, in Libya, women, Libyan women who marry to foreigners are not allowed to give their nationality to their children. And the children are allowed to stay in the country until they are 18. And after that, they get kicked out or they find some sort of sponsorship or a job. Um, and and um, this lady in particular, she um, she even started like an underground movement for other Libyan women who married to, to foreigners to, to help them and help their children, um, especially if these women got divorced or their partner just left the country and they needed help. <clears throat> this lady started this whole thing because of her daughter, which is which was quite a moving story, and she refused to talk about it until we met. And she's like, okay, you are the first person I would be okay to talk about it because you're a Libyan woman. You live here. You face the same prejudice that we face on a daily basis and you understand what we go through. And her daughter, because of those laws un under the Gaddafi regime that um, her, um, well, how can I say this? It's quite sad. Her daughter was seven years old when she died from a heart attack um, at the airport because the mom and the daughter were not allowed to leave the country because of this whole issue with the mom being married to a foreigner. Uh, so the mom just decided to spend the rest of her life fighting for the rights of other Libyan women married to a foreigner. And um, through that, this is just a simple example of how this Libyan lady decided that she's not going to talk about this, she's just going to fight. And then when we met, she felt like she can open up about it to so another Libyan woman who happened to be a journalist, which, um, which is just one example. Uh, other examples are, in general, the women's rights issues in Libya, because the majority um, of the public, men and women, happen to, to, to keep thinking, no, we don't have women's rights. Everything is grand in Libya, um, which is obviously not the truth. Um, and then we start talking a bit by bit, opening different files through either the radio or the TV shows that I was producing. And um, we managed to gain access to, to these stories and we managed to go into these women's homes because me and the team that I worked with, we were all women. And that opened doors that I did not even think possible. Because if you know even a little bit about living society, we are we are very. Um, <laughs> um, if you're a man, you're not going to have the same access to a Libyan home like a woman can, 
which I, I, I'm proud to say that I fully took advantage of that um, particular side of, of being a female and of being a journalist in Libya. Uh, I really appreciate that because I think it demonstrates sort of um, a savviness or a resourcefulness on the part of yeah, <laughs> yeah on the part of women journalists because obviously they recognize um, that there are limitations but they also recognize that despite those limitations there are pockets or areas of coverage that you know we can really take advantage of. I know that I experienced that myself too in the aftermath of the Beirut blast in Lebanon where women survivors were just not comfortable with speaking to men or foreigners. And so I was able to develop bonds with some of these women in a way that I don't think a foreigner could, for example. That's just one really small example. I could list many, and, and there are many other examples in this book. Um, I'd love it if we could move on to Iman. I mean, Iman, um, I know you're not based in Egypt currently, but your work in Egypt, specifically on sexual harassment and assault, was incredibly powerful. And Iman is a photojournalist, so she does do this journalism through imagery. And I'd love it, Iman, if you could tell us a little bit as your experience as a woman journalist who had found herself navigating spaces that were difficult for women journalists um, and, and that you actually, in the same way that Hiba employed that resourcefulness, you did the same thing, but specifically in the subject of sexual assault and wanting to raise awareness on that. Um, hello everyone, thanks for having me. I hope you are hearing me well. Uh, thanks for having me today. Um, um, talking about uh, the topic of uh, sexual harassment in Egypt. So um, me as a woman and also a journalist, I found after like um, in 2011, 2012, that I have to, to, to report about this, uh, this in Egypt and what is going on because I, I didn't found an interest in other journalists to do this. So I, I told myself I have to do something and I started to photograph uh, protests uh, that women uh, have done in Tahrir and other places to fight against harassment. And then I started to photograph, uh, take portraits for um, for women uh, to tell their stories. Um, uh, unfortunately, I was not able to publish the story at the end in Egypt. And uh, of course, I'm glad that I, at the end I published in New York Times. But uh, I would say that my audience, was, uh, main audience for me and important audience, uh, people in Egypt, um, and um, at the time I was working in a local newspaper in Egypt and uh, some of the male um, colleagues or also the editor-in-chief uh, in my newspaper found this is, uh, that they are not comfor comfortable to publish these pictures because it's, it's not the standard uh, and it's, um, um, how I can say, this is... Um, a little bit offense for the, the the masculinity society in Egypt, so they were not happy to publish this, and um, and even uh, afterwards, I I had a chance uh, to present a little some pictures from my work uh, in a, a in a, an event uh, organized by uh, um, uh, United Nations in Egypt. And some audience saw this is uh, not a real picture. They saw this is something that people uh, react to to show something. So it was a shock for them to 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 see this. And um, um, I, I would say I never stopped working on this project. But of course, after I left Egypt, uh, it's a little bit for me. Um, I stopped doing a little like political work or social work in Egypt a little bit. And I try to focus now on uh, producing a different work in Germany. But I was happy last year to, to, to uh, this, some, an initiative, not initiative, but I would say in the, um, uh, a movement started online last year in May or June 2020 in Egypt. Uh, this was online that women started to tell stories. 
uh, with anonymous uh, someone had started this website and uh, telling the stories so this is give uh, uh, more power for women to and, uh, and this was a different not only related to journalists but um, in different um, um, uh, public spaces or uh, workspaces to tell their experience um, about what's going on. So I, I, I'm really happy this uh, this has started in Egypt. Yeah. Thank you so much, Iman, for sharing that with us. I'm curious. I mean, I think the way that journalists have done their work, specifically in the past year and a half, uh, because of COVID, has changed, and we see a lot more. Um, let's say, reporting uh, online, but at the same time, while there has been that kind of mobilization online and some great online initiatives, we're also witnessing a spike in online harassment. Uh, and that can come in the form of trolling, um, which definitely can be a form of harassment, but then it can be even more aggressive in the sense that there can actually be troll armies uh, from particular governments that target particular people. I'm not addressing this uh, this question to anyone in particular, but I'm wondering if someone can talk a little bit perhaps about their experience with um, online harassment. There have been uh, numerous reports that have shown that women in particular are subject to online harassment that can sometimes translate into physical or real har uh, for real life harassment. So it's something that we should really be taking seriously. Can anyone here comment on that? Maybe Ida, because you touched on it a little bit earlier. Sure. I mean, uh, as you said, um, the kind of government-sponsored harassment is very different from uh, individuals attacking you. And um, I'm, I'm the subject of both. Uh, and like a lot of uh, journalists, and especially females, as you said, uh, I think that there have been countless studies that show that females get harassed more. Uh, it, it just the internet is a much more hostile place for women than it is for men. And it just takes, uh, it just has, I mean, it's just so much toxicity in one's life to be confronted to that kind of heat every day. I mean, there isn't a day where I don't, you know, read very unpleasant things about myself uh, or get attacked. Just you know, just like that for anything I say, anything I write, every, everything I write, everything I do is, is analyzed, is trolled, is attacked. Uh, and at the same time, as you said, uh, I covered the trials of journalists in a country where the media is tightly controlled. So I, I don't want to leave uh, the internet, for, you know, uh, because of the trolls, because I feel like my presence uh, is it, you know contributes to informing people in a way that you know a lot of people would lose from me uh, not being on social media, uh, but it's always something I, I consider and think about. It's a bit of a balance, isn't it? Because I mean, I definitely want mm -hmm. to say that uh, what you what you post online is of tremendous value, but you also have to consider your own personal safety. So that's quite difficult. Um, I'm opening. I would like to open up the. And sanity, 100%. Well, you know, in a way, it's it's about mental health, too. You have to project mm. your own mental Absolutely. health. Absolutely. It can be Absolutely. terrifying to be inundated. Mm. I know that I was, you know, once attacked by mm. Sa Saudi Arabian um, trolls and bots, mm. and I had to completely switch off from social media because it can be deeply troubling and worrying to read things mm. like that mm. about yourself, even though you know that. I actually to wanted to ask true. you about that, Zahra. I mean, that, yeah. that was, uh, we've been watching, and that, that, was, that was quite an experience, isn't it? Yeah, I mean, it was terrifying because you also worry about yourself or your family. I had friends telling me you have you have to be careful about people who live um, in certain countries because um, they could be subject to attacks too. So, um, and I know either you've experienced this, but um, there are not enough protections, you know, for people when it comes to this kind of harassment. And also from the mental health perspective, having to read um, threats that are of a very gendered or sexual nature as well can just be deeply, deeply disturbing. Perhaps we can come back to that. I know that we're getting some questions in and I would welcome everyone to ask questions. I also want to very much come back to Iman because you haven't had enough time to, to speak for sure. So um, just looking at the questions um, that I'll be addressing to, to all of us, really, there's a specific question that's come in um, for me, but I'll leave that to the end. That's low priority. <laughs> um, so 
what female journalists do you look up to? Are there any female journalists that you would advise our uh, listeners to, to follow or to read up on? Um, Iman, let's start with you. <laughs> you can't think of anyone, it's fine. You can, you can just say me, you can just say me. <laughs> <laughs> that I can't. Yeah, exactly, I'm just, I'm joking. No, but yeah. I, I really, so <laughs> last month I was working in a project about the, uh, in Berlin, um, about the, how the city is changed to be an exile city for the, the journalist, uh, activist, and uh, um, um, people who uh, relate, Arabs who, who is a part of the culture scene uh, in Berlin. Uh, and I met really a fantastic people and I met a Syrian journalist, her name is Yasmin Marai. She started um, an initiative uh, in Berlin uh, called Women for Common Spaces. So she organized uh, workshops uh, for uh, Syrian refugees mainly, but also other people, ha other women can uh, take part on it to tell uh, to tr try to help them to heal by talking and by writing the diary for their uh, to their um, trip to uh, their journey to come from Syria uh, to Germany and uh, to try to document the, the change in, in their daily life how it, how it, uh, as a as a refugees. So I really was glad to 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 read what uh, what she's uh, her her voice and the other women voices and this is really a fantastic project so i was glad to 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 read her articles and know her. great thank you for sharing that I, you know i would encourage everyone to follow the names of the the women that are going to come up now um hiba what about you um every single one of the ladies in your book <laughs> are women on the ground honestly because uh, yeah. i mean Iman, Aida, and Zahra, you guys are such an inspiration. Reading story after story, they were, they were, they were amazing inspiration to me. And uh, I just hope one day that we can all meet in person. Uh, that would yes. be a great thing. But yeah, for me, inspiration, it will definitely be every single one of the ladies in the book. Indeed, I would agree with you. Aida. Yes, yeah, same the women in the book and, and our common friend, Lina Ejelet, because, you know, you have these women who are in very difficult countries to report and are on the ground and speak the language and understand things that other reporters don't and do amazing work and probably don't have the ego to be known as much as uh, some of their colleagues. Um, I would, I would absolutely agree, especially on Lina Ajaylat, and uh, I would add Lina Atala too for the, um, yeah. for their commitment to independent media outlets. Independent media in the Arab world is constantly under yeah. threat. It is constantly yeah. underfunded, and they produce some of the most incredible, nuanced, and authentic and original reporting out of the region without getting the attention that other media outlets get. Of course, Lina Atalla has rightfully been celebrated. She was one of, um, uh, mm -hmm. she was a time person of the year last year, um, even though she's not that type of person who's kind of pursuing that international attention at all. Um, and I do wanna say, you know, the women in this book really struggled. Um, I know Ida personally, and I know that Ida started as a stringer, you know, and she worked her way up to the level of recognition that she has today. And that's absolutely true to Hiba and Iman. And I think this is a, a good segue into um, coming back to Iman on the subject of diversity. I know that in the book you mentioned that you struggled as someone who was a local where assignments were being passed on to, let's say white male or foreign journalists who, uh, not necessarily white and male, but often that, um, who were kind of trusted in a way that you weren't. Could you talk to us a little bit about that? Um, yeah, I I would say this is one. So I left Egypt for different uh, reasons. And one of them, it's and most of them was related were related to my career. And I I would say I would really fed up from waiting to get an assignment, or uh, after taking pictures, is that I would for covering maybe some uh, uh, spot news happen like in sometimes it's like an explosion or something and I end up, I, I, can't, I can't find a place to, to, to publish my pictures. And then I find at the same way, uh, at the same time, uh, uh, um, uh, um, a, a 
another photographer. Uh, I love all of them. I respect their work also. This is not their problem, but, but this is related to how the editors really deal with the locals. And uh, someone gets like three, three assignments in one day. And I would never like understand this. So why this happened, there is no reasons. And um, um, so for me, this is what like, okay, I, I can't do this anymore. Um, maybe when I uh, decided to leave Egypt, I, I thought also I would have a bigger chance to work here. But uh, after I came to Germany, I found myself also that uh, some editors or um, I have to some, I, it looks like I'm, I'm starting from point zero. And what I, the, the 10 years or 11 years, I already have done the job, it's, it's not counted because I'm still uh, not good to speak German. So I can do this, but of course not like the, the native speaker or even people who live here for maybe five or 10 years. So uh, this is also a kind of little bit frustrating for me now, um, but I hope this would change. So I try a little bit to find a way uh, for people or uh, organizations for, uh, which have an interest to do projects related to Arabs uh, who live in, in Germany. So this year, um, um, I just have done, uh, was working in a project in Berlin. And also uh, next week, I have an exhibition, uh, opening exhibition here in Hanover, where I live. Also, it's related to the 10 years after the Arab Spring. So I try to find a way to still working. So maybe the editors here give me a chance to, to do, uh, like get normal assignments, so. Yeah, I really, I really respect you, you know, the, the, the amount of work and persistence that you have despite those setbacks where we all know, I think, that there are structural problems when it comes to diversity in newsrooms, that locals and stringers and fixers in particular are not given the same protections as foreign correspondents. But also we, you know, we, we still see a pattern of tokenism in newsrooms where, you know, they might have a you know, few diverse uh, hires or, or, or um, they might open up their pool of candidates when hiring, um, but it's not enough, more needs to be done uh, we did see some changes, particularly when it comes to the Arab world. I mean, in this book, uh, we have a couple of, of women who, I mean, Rula Khalaf is now the editor of the FT, and that's a huge step forward. Uh, Jane Adraf is, is now the Baghdad bureau chief for the New York Times. And I celebrate these changes, and I, and I would say that these are steps forward. But I also think it is incredibly important to recognize that we, can, we continue to see structural issues when it comes to diversity in newsrooms and the diversity um, when it comes to coverage of conflict zones. So we need to be very mindful of that. And thank you for sharing your own experience uh, with us, Iman. Um, does anyone yeah. want to add anything to that? Go on, Iman. To, to, to add anything, I just forget, yeah. So one experience I have, and on, on this is our, also other experience for other uh, colleagues in Egypt, is that sometimes uh, a journalist of um, international, I would say, journalists like from Europe or US coming to Egypt, and they don't, they, of course, they are protected because they're passports, and then they don't think when they work with the locals like us, if they put us in interest or not. And this is sometimes what really we, we at the end, this could change our life because a, 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 a mistake uh, uh, from a journalist who, who have an ego, not to think about safety when he, he or she working with, uh, especially he, uh, working with a, a local fixer or a photographer uh, in the region. This is really um, big trouble. Yeah, and it really reflects the theme in the book that the stakes are so much higher for local journalists. You know, they're not flying in and flying out. They don't have the privilege of a passport. They don't have those protections. But often they're turned to for the nuance and the insight that is needed by the foreign publications. So that really points to a continued problem in the industry. 
that I think, you know, women like us are doing so much to address, but there needs to be more change. Does anyone want to add anything before I move on to another question? Great, thanks so much. Um, there's a couple of questions about our women on the ground, which I'm gonna try and quickly answer. Um, would I edit another volume of writing on female Arab journalists? I absolutely would. If there, um, you know, there was no limit to the number of women that I could have included in the book, I could have gone a hundred plus, you know, I had to be considering a lot of things like um, making sure that the different countries and conflicts were represented, also the different age groups different, uh, you know, um, nationalities, different, uh, different backgrounds, different religious backgrounds, so on. So I had to be thinking even about age, even about type of journalists when I was curating this book. So it was very difficult for me to arrive at 19 women. And even then, I was feeling that um, some countries should have been represented when they weren't. Countries like Tunisia, Bahrain, um, other countries from the from the North Africa region, other countries from the Gulf, the Persian Gulf region, um, sorry, the Arabian Gulf region. I know that's a controversial term, um, and also perhaps that it could be broadened to include um, Middle East uh, rather than Arab. So then that would uh, open the doors for um, an Iranian journalist, for example, or a Turkish journalist, and so on. So there's much more to be done in this area, and it brought me much joy to work with such incredible women um, despite the fact that the stories were so harrowing for me this was an act of celebration when it comes to the strength of the women and the courage of the women and the bravery in the book which I think all of, of the women today have touched on they've really showed how courageous and, and brave they are um, so yes I would absolutely do, do this again and I think I would have fewer Lebanese women too I think the issue with um with Lebanese women is it tend to be, Lebanese women tend to be much more active in journalism because there are fewer restrictions on, on um, Lebanese women in journalism. But generally, yes, there's, there are, are other, other stories and, and other countries and other conflicts that, that could definitely be covered. So thank you for asking that question. Um, and then there is another one also on the book. How, what has the reception been to the book in the MENA region? I don't know if anyone wants to add to this, but it has been overwhelmingly positive. I have had no negative reaction. I think there has been a lot of trolling for, for people who were um, agitated by what was written in particular chapters. I know Zainat Hayim, for example, she's a Syrian journalist, faced some online harassment because of it. Um, but that just goes to show that what the content of the book was necessary and needed to be out there, um, irrespective of that agitation. The agitation shows that um, uh, the, these stories need to be heard and told and to have a bigger audience, not just globally, but also in the region itself, given that there are many restrictions in the region. There are many regimes and there are many non-state actors that would rather not read stories like this. And I think that actually ties or segues into why we haven't found a publisher in the Arab world. We are still working for that. Um, we haven't had any publisher, publisher that has felt that this would wouldn't be risky. They all feel that it would be too risky to publish the book given some of the content of the book. Although really my hope was that we would find um, an independent or smaller publisher perhaps. Um, but we are still hopeful that we will find. I mean, there is an Israeli publisher that, that wanted to publish the book, but for numerous un unnamed reasons, um, we did not go in that uh, direction. Um, but I'm, I'm very much hopeful. Um, for the future and the reception is overwhelmingly positive and that's demonstrated by so many messages that I get from young and aspiring women journalists across the region who have read this book and want to pursue careers in journalism and I really want to say that it's because of the stories of Aida and Hiba and Iman and the others in the book that this is why they're they have been galvanized despite all of the challenges that that the women have been facing they feel that they want to follow in the footsteps of these great women and, and, and that to me is the ultimate signal of success and positive reception in the region. Does anyone wanna share anything else? I mean, all of you have been tweeted about and celebrated and I always see like little Instagram posts with like sections or paragraphs from your individual essays. Um, anyone wanna to add to that? Anyone, has anyone had negative mm -hmm. response to their essays? Go on, Aiza. No, 
I just wanted to say also it's important to emphasize your role in, in all of these essays and, and your guidance. And I want to take this moment to say thank you for that. I, I very much deeply appreciate that. Thank you, Aida, so much. <laughs> Yeah, me too. Um, to, to, to thank you, Zahra, because this is, was the first time for me to write a long uh, article. And, and without you, without your guidance, without your editing at the end a couple of times, then this would not be the, as it, as the production at the end. And for the, the mm -hmm. feedback, I, I really uh, feel thrilled every time i get an email or uh, comment or message on instagram from someone who wrote uh, read my, my the my essay and say from uh, different countries all over the world when this happens really <laughs> make my day happy so yeah thank you thank you for yeah giving me the chance to be worked on the book with the uh, lovely ladies amazing that's that's wonderful um and i remember you know how hesitant some of you were in the beginning when i approached you and it was a real journey to get to know each one of you through your experiences and for me it's and i've said this before and i'll say it again it's the most fulfilling work that i've ever done um and i will continue to do it absolutely so there's a question in on um Personal thoughts, 10 years since the Arab Spring, are we hopeful for change? I will say I'm overall not hopeful. I think there are pockets of hope, but to say that I am hopeful in a generic sense would not be true to my feelings. There are pockets of hope in individual countries. And I think there are people who will continue to push for change. It's so vast and most questions that I personally will not get into specific countries. And especially because I'm, I'm Lebanese and the country is absolutely falling apart right now. So um, does anyone here have any thoughts that they want to share? I know uh, you wrote a great essay for the New York Review of Books about this subject, Ida, where you spoke to different activists across the region. Maybe you want to touch on that essay that you wrote or piece that you wrote. Right, it just felt very depressing to do that over yeah. the, the 10 years after. Uh, it just felt like um, uh, f freedom rights activists have, have, have just lost the, the battle. It just feels that way in many places. Egypt is, is a nightmare. Uh, uh, Morocco is becoming a nightmare. I mean, a lot of places are just um, seeing unprecedented crackdowns uh, and it feels like the pandemic just added to everything, just made it, you know, easier for these governments to to do that kind of crackdown. And um, yeah, I'm not I'm not very hopeful at all. I, I mean, I have a hard time seeing um, the possibility for anything positive. You know, like I, I don't know. I just uh, Tunisia is is maybe the only place where I see things moving forward and and staying on the right direction, even if sometimes there are uh, events that happen that kind of contradict that. But overall, it's still moving forward. But um, I mean, I, I, I just don't, I don't know. But again, history has, has showed that things change. And, and, and I mean, if in 2010, someone had told me that Tunisians would uh, uh, stand up to, to to their uh, to, to their president the way they did, I would have never bet a penny on it. And uh, if I remember the state of mind, then I wouldn't have predicted 2011. And I think we kind of see the same thing now. But again, when we see the protests in Palestine, that kind of uh, a breath of fresh air, and and that kind of also tells me maybe you know something is going to happen again. Mm -hmm. I don't know. Yeah, I know it's packaged in Western press. It's like Gen Z mobilizing to make change. It is positive. I think ultimately, if you have people still protesting, I think the concerning thing, the overall worry is the, worry is the crackdown on dissidents, as you say, and journalists are included among those dissidents. And, you know, assassination. I mean, Lebanon, Lokman um, Slim, who was an activist, um, was, was, you know, shot and killed. Um, and when you see that kind of... Um, uh, level of uh, attack or um, uh, despair that people feel um, in response to those crackdowns. It's very hard to be hopeful. I don't know if um, 
Iman or Hiba, you want to add and, anything? And, and I wanted go to on, add on, one, one last thing. Yeah, yeah, just one last thing is that when Khashoggi was was murdered and in the worst possible way, someone could die. Uh, and then they got away with it. So it feels like now you can get away with, you know, murdering a journalist in that way. So then, you know, it opens the door to so many violations against journalists and human rights defenders overall. Absolutely. It's impunity across the region, really. Um, Hiba Iman, do you want to add anything to that or are we good? Uh, honestly, uh, you say <laughs> pockets of hope. I say I don't even see those pockets. So, oh wow! Uh, yeah. for, for, at least for Libya. Look, I'm I'm going to talk about Libya. Libya, and, and if if you think Lebanon is is falling apart, Libya is is gone. And yeah. the fact that there is yet another new government, I don't, I can't even keep track. Is it like the seventh or the eighth? This ten last ten years. Um, and, and they cannot do anything. I mean, the country is in, in complete pieces. Um, and coronavirus made everything 10 times worse from um, the, the electricity problem that you spend almost 14, 15 hours a day without electricity, to the water shortages, to the cash shortages, to the medication problem. Uh, and now hit by, by corona, things just keep piling up and, and getting worse. So am I hopeful? Honestly, no. Uh, just the short answer to be <laughs> yeah i will specify that that yeah i'll specify that the pockets i was referring to were extremely small pockets <laughs> um <laughs> barely visible to to most um no but i appreciate your thoughts there and i and i think it's something we all share it's the despair it's the humiliation it's also i think in the case of libya particularly troubling because it's almost fallen out of the international media narrative, right? So there are these waves of interest that come and go. And then, you know, the, the, the people in the country themselves are struggling so much, but we're not really, I mean, of course there are some publications that still continue to do journalism out of, out of Libya, but it's not in the same, the attention is not in the, at the, to the same extent that it was previously. Would you agree with that, Hiba? 100%. The, 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 yeah. the attention right now, it's mainly because foreign journalists are not really allowed easily into yeah. the country, not anymore. And the uh, Libyan journalists inside the country, doesn't matter if they are follow, if they work for a Libyan or an international entity, they're still very restricted and under constant yeah. threat. So the, 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 everyday, the everyday human story, you're not going to hear it. Um, and I doubt that we're going to hear much about it. I mean, I know what I know because my family's still on the ground there and, and they keep me informed of everyday struggles uh, for the media the only thing they care about is you know the, the number of the new foreign mercenaries been sent by russia or turkey or egypt mm -hmm. or, or whatever and the amount of guns in and out and how that affects the illegal immigration to europe and that's basically the main focus for the uh, foreign press when it comes to libya which is sad because I, I think it is the people inside like you said the the, the struggle and the humiliation is just keeps piling up and it's getting worse by day. It's a very tragic way to approach the end of the talk. We've got five minutes, so I'd love it if we could maybe look at look forward a little bit to whatever you're working on now that you would like to share. Um, Iman, let's start with you. Um, yeah, um, so as I said, I'm this year I was working two projects related to 10 years after the Arab Spring. Uh, here in Germany and um, um, this helped me a little bit to start again working in, in Germany so I, I just I try to push myself uh, to do work even if there is a, a, there is no space until now I found in, in, in media here for me uh, and um, yeah I just try to keep keep doing what what I want to do so and just f try to find a way or people who would believe about what I'm doing just yeah even I will not get enough money but uh, to help me continue but still so I have to figure out how to do this and maybe I would would back one day but no I to continue a little bit work in Egypt, I'm still not sure, but I, I didn't like completely shut down this uh, page because I am still want to do some to keep working in some projects in Egypt. 
Absolutely. Well, best of luck, Iman. We'll be following you closely. Hiba, what are you working on right now? Uh, well, thanks to Corona, I've been, and I'm, I'm a diabetic, so my immune system is compromised. So I've been very much confined at home. But remotely, I uh, managed to finish, and actually we just published it, um, it's a series, it's a mini series, YouTube series about the focus of uh, culture and music in Libya, which is one of the very few remaining outlets for this generation to just express themselves. So um, we worked, uh, I worked as a director and producer for the series, it's a mini series, it's like five minutes each, focusing on different uh, music genres from the Libyan culture, like we went to the desert, to the Bedou, we we went to the rap scene and Benghazi and Tripoli. It, it was it was a very colorful uh, project, and it's quite interesting to direct and produce something without actually setting foot in Libya, thanks to today's technology of communication. And um, apart from that, I'm just working on a small documentary here in Malta. Uh, we just finished filming, so I'm still not ready yet to talk about it. But it's it's focused on life and small village and how small it can possibly be in in um, in the shadow of you know uh, working globally and everybody's like stuck at home and everybody's yet yeah, very connected and very isolated in the same time. It's a quite interesting topic. But yeah, that's uh, that's pretty much what I've been working on. Apart from that, I've been enjoying home and reading a lot of books. I'm excited to watch the uh, the one on the uh, Libyans and music. I, I love that cultural angle. It's, it's, not it's one already that's online. Enough. It's called Lahni. Yeah. It's called Lahni. It's already online Ooh. on YouTube. I'll be happy to share the uh, link with you guys later. Yeah. Please do, Heba. Aida, what about you? I'm actually exhausted and, and a bit burnt out from covering the, <laughs> <laughs> covering the trials. <laughs> so I'm just looking forward to not doing much in the coming uh, month or so and kind of clear my head and see what's next. Uh, I want to come visit you, Zahra, so that's <laughs> what's next. I am, I am very excited to host you, Aida. I cannot wait. And um, uh, good, good luck with taking a break because your breaks don't usually last too long. <laughs> and I, know, I am working I on, a, on a, yeah, I'm working on a book about the cultural history of eyeliner, which I told Hiba about in Tunisia like two years ago. So um, it starts well, honestly, with like, I'm to... loving your eyeliner today. Just mentioning. Thank the, yes, I was going to say, I was going to say too. Thank you. <laughs> it is a very serious topic that may appear to be trivial to some, but the history, the roots of eyeliner start in ancient Egypt in Iman's homeland with Queen Nefertiti. And it will take us up to the present day. So I'm mean, really excited to do that. It's quite different than anything I've done before. Um, but this has been so, so lovely. Uh, thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, um, everyone, for joining us today for your thank excellent you. questions. And thank you again once more to the Liverpool Arab Arts Festival for arranging this. It's been so much fun speaking to everybody. Please follow us all on Twitter. And, and if you have any questions, I'm sure, additional questions, I'm sure we would all be happy to get back to you. So have a wonderful day, everyone, wherever you are. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Bye. Thank you. Bye.